Welcome to episode 38 of the Camerosity Podcast, the world's number one open source film photography podcast. My name is Mike Ekman, and we are back to our normal time after having a nice chat with our European listeners. Thanks to everyone who showed up and regaled us with hopeful fantasies about each person's country winning the World Cup. Last episode, we learned that there is a European Paul Reibold, but since there's nothing better than the original, here is the Paul Reibold of Paul Reibolds, Mr. Paul Reibold. Is what they say true, that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? Well, yeah, but I, you know, I really, uh, I think one is actually enough. Too many Paul Reibolds is not a good thing, huh? More than one is a problem. Next. Fresh off another 85-hour shift slinging mocha lattes and scones is our resident barista extraordinaire, Anthony Rue. Have you ever considered hiring some employees to help you out at the shop, Anthony? That would take some of the fun out of it. I don't know. You know, it's just, you know all work and no play makes Anthony a better photographer? I don't know. And finally, back from his trip to the Middle East, where he successfully smuggled cases of alcoholic beer under his trench coat is Mr. Theo Panagopoulos. How was your trip watching the World Cup, Theo? It's been a bit of a ride. Unfortunately, Australia's out now, so um, that, that's a bit of a downer. The United States and Australia went out on the same day, so who's your pick to win it all? I was hoping Japan would actually be able to push through, but they, they weren't able to today. They went out on penalties. So I think Spain's got a very good chance. They're looking very, very sharp. Well, we'll know probably at the next episode. We have a couple people in the waiting room, so let's open up the doors and let them in. Looks like we have some returning faces. Uh, I'm looking at Bob Rodoloni. Hey, Bob, welcome back. Thank you. How's things going? Way over three minutes from my house. Well, today my wife was possibly found to have COVID, maybe. Oh, oh geez. She has some oh, of the nice. symptoms, but not all of them. And they had to put her on the oral medication because we've had all of our shots. And now I think she's trying to give it to me, which would be the perfect crime. Stay you in know, the room. Knock me off early. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any cameras with fungus lenses? Maybe that'll like protect you. I don't know. No, I don't. Actually, I don't. What about some radioactive tacomars? No, but I do have a, um, well, I don't have it anymore. Well, <laughs> the 3518 Nikkor rangefinder lens had turned yellow over age and uh, from lanthium glass. And also the 511 had some lanthium glass in it, which I guess was radioactive to a certain degree. Wouldn't it be something if they found that small amounts of radiation actually killed COVID? And all of us camera collectors <laughs> live forever. It'd be interesting, like, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we could rub Hold cameras all shoot, shoot with it for about an hour, right? <laughs> yeah. Just don't eat it, right? Just a word of warning to the to the people listening, though. Please do not go and lick your radioactive lenses. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. Well, at Nikon actually had a problem later on with that. Their 35 1.4 that they made for the reflexes in the mid to late 60s. It was the fastest 35 in the world at that time, turns yellow over, over age. Okay, there's, the glass turns, actually turns yellow. Well, if there's a brand of lenses that's known to turn yellow over time, it's Tecumar. So uh, yeah. maybe we'll get into some Pentax discussion later today. Okay. All right. Uh, Mario Piper, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me again. Dude, the mustache is even better than last time. <laughs> oh, thanks. It is <laughs> it's awesome. It's a, a little bit itchy, but uh, I, I like growing it. So. You cut your hair, too, so you got a shorter hair but the butt bushy mustache. I mean, <laughs> you're, go you're going full Tom Selleck right there, I think. I, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, those radioactive uh, lenses are just awesome. I was shooting with my uh, my uh, Spotmatic with the 50 mil one four radioactive today with a really slow film and i love it very cool miles Lieback, welcome back welcome back thanks uh thanks for having me good to see everyone anything new with you uh i just picked up a late double stroke m3 Ooh, interesting the question we have to ask miles every time he's on is what kind of drink do you have next <laughs> to you tonight i have a peerless small batch bourbon and nice, uh, nice snifter glass you got there yep it's, i got it in my glen cairn it's good glass good drink <laughs> God, I want to visit your house. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. And we got Dave Roberts. Dave, welcome to the show. I don't recall that you've been on before. So um, have you been listening to the show for a while? I've listened to all of them. Uh, it's my first time being able to call in. Right. Where are you from? Zoom in. Uh, Luther, Michigan. It's in Michigan. Awesome. I was just there uh, over the Thanksgiving holiday. And my father-in-law lives up in Gaylord, which is um, oh, okay. Near the top of the mitten, as people from right. Michigan yeah, call it. It's like uh, the middle finger, second knuckle. There you if go. If you hold your hand up in front of you. All right. <laughs> Luther, Luther's where your ring would be on your ring finger. <laughs> okay. 
what kind of cameras uh, do you shoot? Like, what's your favorite flavor of photography? Well, I shoot digital now, but uh, I was a professional for 25 years in Detroit. Um, and I use Nikon and Canon. Mike, you ran right away. Yeah, Mike, I was going to say, for, oh the, for the listeners, Mike has just picked, jumped up, run away, and left us here. <laughs> My son has to practice using a recorder for his school, and he picked right now to start practicing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear it. (laughs) Maybe. All right. Well, cool. So we got some, uh, a nice variety of people here. You know, one thing that occurred to me today is the 5th of December. So this will probably pass before I have a chance to get this episode out there. But uh, Wednesday is going to be 12 seven. So for those of us who live in countries that correctly put the month before the date, uh, that means it's going to be 127 day. So does anybody here have any 127 cameras that might be interesting that they would want to talk about, perhaps? I've got my uh, Delta D3. It's loaded with uh, some expired Kodakolor VR200. I'm shooting it at ISO 3. Oh, nice. Nice. I love these cameras. Uh, really Mario, is, is that the one? That's not the one you with a GSK on the on the lens. No, no. It just says Delta D3. Okay. Um, and that's... That's all the indication that it has other than the, you know, the settings, but I love it. Love it. Love it. Are you related to Neil Piper? <laughs> I don't think, so. well, I mean, it may, maybe way, way, way far back, but I saw his post. Okay. Yeah. And, he uh, posted a picture of a, a, a camera he was trying to identify, which yeah. was a Gelto GSK. It was the first version of the Geltos, but it was yeah. really nasty. I mean, it was, uh, it, it yeah. looked like a barn find. Uh, lost barn for a long time. I just had a, a really nice uh, D3, uh, like what you and, and Mike have. It's a great yeah. camera. I saw it on your uh, Etsy store. Yeah, it sold uh, just a few days ago. Nice. This is completely, you guys are going to think that I staged this, but I didn't. But my review tomorrow is for the Gelto. That's why I had it handy here. So it turns out, now this is kind of an interesting thing. They made the Gelto from about 37 to 1952. And there's a ton of different variations. And almost all of them are called the Gelto D3. So it's, there are ways to identify like which sub variant there are. Um, there's a couple that actually have range finders. The later ones, a, a quick, I'll, I'll give a cheat sheet here. But if you have on the top plate, this lever that is used to open the film compartment, that guarantees it's a post-war model. You, okay. So yours is, that, is different. No, yours okay. is different though. You probably have a pre-war model then. Yours is older than mine is. Okay. So does your entire back come off or does it load entirely through the bottom? From the top. The top lifts off. The top lift. That's right. I'm sorry. I had it backwards. So if it's a top loader, it's definitely an early model. Uh, They eventually, they made a version which had uh, the back came off and then they eventually settled on like mine, which opens. So you, you slide the bottom and back off and you you load it this way. So these are a lot easier to load because you're essentially loading it like any normal roll film camera does, but yours, Mario, you have to load from the top, which is, Virgen made a camera called the Gaverette. I've also reviewed, and that's the same way as yours. It loads from the top. Yeah, those look like nice cameras. Have you gotten pictures from yours? Um, yeah, I've, I I've, I think I've shot three rolls through this. A roll of Kodak Gold, fresh Kodak Gold from the 120 roll. Right. Uh, I bought it from some guy on eBay, and I really like how those images came out. Um, and cool. also a couple of rolls of um, uh, expired Kodak Color VR. 200 i shot it at iso 200 and i love the results yeah Um, one of the things i really like about the camera is everything even despite how old it is the focusing mechanism it's a little bit tight but it's smooth all the you know the aperture settings the shutter speed all that is very very smooth and i just i really like it mario is your camera black it is Is black it's okay black with um you know it's kind of brassing but it's mainly black yeah but mike is yours gold or is it silver gold it's gold yeah the gold is the one I the one I had was gold also. Yeah, most of the post war ones were. Uh, the black ones like Mario has yours is worth substantially more than the other mm-hmm. ones are. So far few of far fewer of them were black like that. Yeah, I don't I don't think I'm going to be selling it. I just I love using it. It's just yeah, kind of a funky cool. little camera, but makes nice images. So all right, I had no idea that one twenty seven day was even a thing, and then today <laughs> I find out that I. Uh, unintentionally am going to be able to shoot on 127 day because friend of the show, Mike Novak shipped me down his pilot 
which is a 1931 127 TLR. Uh, it's a folding TLR where the front pops out and then it focuses with a scissoring mechanism. And it's a it's actually a camera that that uh, Mike Ekman has reviewed on his site. Yeah, it's it's literally the exact camera because Mike Novak sent it to me to borrow about three years ago, and uh, and then I sent it back to him. And then he um, so did did he did, did you guys trade or how did you get it? Uh, well, I had been loaning him my my Pin F, and uh, when he shipped it back to me eventually, the uh, the pilot is in the box. Very cool. That's an awesome camera. It's there's nothing yeah. else like it. Picture, I mean, if you see it, it folds, so it's quite compact, but it also shoots three by four. So it's it's like the half, it's not technically half frame, but it's the smaller frame of 127. So you get 16 images on a roll of film out of that thing. And it has, for a camera from 1931, it's got all sorts of like crazy innovations, like a, a little brass winding lever that pops out and then it uh, advances an automated frame counter that's... Uh, so you don't have to use the rear, the Ruby window to look at the numbers as you're going through it. Uh, KW Kino work made that. And, you know, the, the more I've studied older, you know, the early Japanese, the early um, German camera makers, uh, KW is probably one of my favorites. I mean, practically everything they did was cool, including the Practina, which is, is another one of my early favorite SLRs that that pilot. Uh, they also made a pilot six, which is really awesome. They made a camera. Um, I'm drawing a blank, but when it folds, it's ridiculously thin. Patent Itui, E T U I. Yeah, Itui. That's it. It was sort of a sort of a con convex. Uh, yeah. Uh, shape when it was closed. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a regular, you know, folding camera, but when it collapses, I mean, it's like maybe an inch thick, inch it and a half. Cool film. It was bakelite, bakelite body. Okay, that I didn't know. I've actually never seen one in person. I've only seen pictures online. Yeah, I've had a couple of them. They're really beautiful camera. So you're going to load that thing up, Anthony? Do you have any film? I am. I do believe that you sent me a roll of 127 about two years ago with the eventuality okay. that I might come across a 127 camera. All right. Cool. And I think that the, its day has come tomorrow. <laughs> Did I tell you what kind of film it was? I don't remember. <laughs> Because I don't know what I would have said. I mean, I probably did, but... Uh... Barochrome pan, maybe? I... Okay. I would probably assume 50, ASA 50, I think would be a safe bet. Because I don't know that I would have had anything faster than that. And anything I did would be expired. So you'd want to shoot slower anyway. So yeah. I would probably aim for 50 and just see what happens. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Theo's got something in his hand. What do you have there, Theo? I have a um, Goldie. Ooh, uh, you I have think, the Zek? Uh, the Zek Goldie. Um, which I picked up in an auction uh, uh, a few months ago. This thing um, is tiny. It is tiny. It's about, yeah, it's it's actually uh, interesting enough. We were having a conversation in the pre-show about um, some other 6x4, 5 cameras, and we were talking about comparisons and sizes and Japanese cameras and so on. This this isn't Japanese, but it's this is tiny. I mean, it's it shoots 127. It's got the two windows at the back. Um, it's not a rangefinder, so obviously that's probably helps it in terms of its size. Um, Mark, do you remember when these were built? Though? These are no, um, well, let's see. I did review one. I don't remember. I mean, it's I'm sure it's probably 30s. You know, maybe it went 30s, to the 40s. Yeah, it looks 30s. It looks 30s. Mine looks the one that I reviewed looks a little older than yours. Yours is probably late 30s. Is what shutter is on yours? Is it a what synchro shutter? comper? Comper. It's a plain comper? Yeah. Okay. So if it's not the synchro, it's going to be probably a little earlier. So that's probably early to mid-30s, if I had to guess. That's something I've been looking forward to, to trying out, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it looks like a fun camera. A cool feature of that camera, but it's really hard to exploit, is that the lens focus is way closer than the minimum indicated it does. Um, Adam Paul is a huge fan of that camera, and I believe he said it goes down to about two feet. Yeah, because if you... If you look at it here, uh, it's got the measurements for the focus. Um, so as you sort of wind, oh, so I'm not holding it up, right? As you wind through, it goes past the minimum 1.5, one, uh, sorry, the one, the minimum one, and then goes all the way to this little knob here. It almost felt like the, the lens was going to unscrew right. itself out. No, that's, that's, they all do that. I don't know why. I mean, I think it's cool, but it, it makes no sense why they didn't mark it. Like if, yeah. if they're allowing you to do it, why not put a little mark there and tell you what distance it is? Probably so because they're actually... not a range finder. So you, you're not actually really focusing on it. You'd have to be yeah. measuring very closely. 
Yeah. And I'm not sure many people would be, would have been doing it back then. No, probably not. But maybe that was like their like Easter egg. Has anyone ever um rolled their here at least rolled their own 127 film from a reel? Yes. Paul sent me a roll of bulk 46 millimeter Fuji Pro 160. Okay. So 127 is exactly 46 millimeters wide. Um, you do need obviously 127 backing paper. Mm -hmm. So if you have some old rolls of 127, save the backing paper as, as best as you can. I found that really using the paper and retaping and then unrolling it, it the, the paper does degrade. So you're only going to get a couple uses out of each paper, but save it as much as you can. Uh, or get one of those slitters that can slit 120 down to 127. And it also slits the paper too. So you can reuse that. But um, what I did was I usually do all my like loading a film from bulk loaders. I have a bathroom down here with no lights in it. So mm -hmm. I took out a developed roll of one, a real 127. And I stretched it out. And coincidentally on the vanity, the bathroom sink it goes from one knob to the other. Oh, nice. You may not have a vanity with the exact same dimensions, but try to find something that you can feel in the dark that's about the same length. I mean, it it doesn't have to be like to the millimeter perfect, but right. you want it, you want to cut a piece that's about the same length as real 127. So you you th you know, you don't use the old film anymore, but you reuse the paper and you gotta find the part where the tape needs to go, right? Usually it's creased there or there'll be some, or the old tape might even still be there. If the old tape is still there, do not try to reuse it. I like to use just electrical tape. Mm -hmm. I like electrical tape because it's sticky enough to hold the film there, but it's, it's not like you could peel it fairly easily too. So yeah. what I usually do is I take it with the lights on with my paper. I cut a piece of black electrical tape and put it where it needs to be. Then turn the lights off open up your bulk roll, pull out a piece, hold it up to whatever your measuring stick is to get your length, cut it, and then try to remember which side is the emulsion side. I mean, it's pretty yeah. easy because it'll always curl towards that side. Really? And then with your fingers, you just have to find where the tape is, peel it back a little bit and just try to get the tape stuck there. Do your, I mean, it's, it's a pain in the butt, you know, once you do it enough times or you start to get the hang of it, but you got to make sure that the film is parallel to the backing paper so that when you're rolling it up, it's not skewing off into a direction, but yeah. uh, you basically then just roll it back up, make sure you get it to the beginning and then you just load it like you would any other 127 roll. And if you started it where the tape goes, your exposure numbers should line up perfectly. So um, when mm -hmm. you reuse it in another camera, you, you can rely on the exposure numbers. Whereas I had a uh, 3D printed slitter that cuts down 120 to 127. And depending on the film, usually the numbers will not line up correctly. Oh, so yeah. that's a, that's a benefit. It's, it's not a problem for a camera like the Ashika 44, or uh, we were talking with Anthony earlier, that pilot uh, counts off exposures on its own. So if you're using a camera where you need to use the red windows, like the Gelto, you know, it has <laughs> the windows in the back, then as long as you're using bulk 46 millimeter film on a uh, regular real 127 paper, it's going to work perfectly. Okay. I've done 35 millimeter. I red scaled some, I think, Superior, Fuji Superior, and uh, shot one roll of that in, in this camera. And it worked out pretty well. But on eBay, I, I see, I've seen a, or I'm gonna gonna be buying. Hopefully, it's available this coming within a couple of days. Uh, 100 feet of Agfa Portrait XPS 160, and I've shot that in 35 millimeter. I love the colors, so I'm thinking it's not gonna be that old. And if with a whole yeah. bulk roll, I can you know bracket the first the first uh, you know the first roll and find out what the proper exposure would be. There must have been, maybe Paul, you would know, there must have been some kind of like school camera that used 46 millimeter film or something. Yeah, the Beatty Portronics and uh, I can't remember the other one, but yeah, there were, there were a number of them. They were, they were split framed. They were for school photography. For, school photography you know, cameras. Yeah. yeah. It, usually what AC powered. Yeah. Right. They were AC. Yeah. They built so, in flash and, you know. Right. Because um, all the bulk 46 millimeter film, like what you mentioned, uh, Mario, the Fuji that I have, I know they also made Kodak Portra in, um, in that too. And all of those are that 160 ASA portrait film. So 
Um, I, I suspected what, what Paul just confirmed, but that would have been a bulk film for like student pictures. The good thing is a lot of those color films hold up pretty well. The Fuji I had expired in 05. And while there is a small amount of color shift, it's still very usable. Whereas, you know, some color films just, they, they fall off a cliff after about 10 years. So you should have pretty good luck. Yeah, both both uh, rolls that I shot of the uh, XPS 160, the Agfa, um, I didn't know the dates of either one. One was in a found camera. I got it at a, at a, an estate sale. And so I just shot the entire roll, uh, not knowing what the expiration date was. And I tell you what, the colors were gorgeous. I might have shot it at 100 or something like that. And then the other roll, I shot it at 50. And I think I might have even overexposed. So I'm yeah. 100, 125, something would be just fine. Do we do, we do miles yet? No, miles. The only, the only 127 I've shot is the two cameras I borrowed from you, Mike. The, yeah. The Calibri. And is it, is it that, is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, it was, the, it was the Calibri. And I sent you one of the night or the um, Vest Pocket yeah. Exactas. Yeah. Yeah. Both cool. I don't think I'll ever do it again. <laughs> so was, was 127 primarily like a, a german and u.s thing no ironically kodak is the first person to do that with the vest pocket the kodak vp they uh kodak and their never-ending mission to create as many film formats as possible when they created the original vest pocket kodak 1912 is when that model first came out and they created the format for it because they wanted something small enough to literally fit in a vest pocket and uh, it proved to be enormously successful so much so that for the longest time, for probably the first two decades of its existence, people didn't call it 127. It was literally called Vest Pocket Film. Um, and and tons of companies made cameras called Vest Pockets. You know, I know Minolta had a Minolta Vest Pocket. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the German cam- or companies did as well. So it was definitely a Kodak thing. It was, I, it was equally loved by the Japanese. There's a ton of early. In fact, you look at um, Sugiyama's Guide to Japanese Cameras. I'm just going to make up a number here. More than 50% of pre-war Japanese cameras were 127. Wow. They really embraced no it. Yeah. And uh, the Germans did a lot of it, too. Obviously, Kodak did. Um, honestly, I, 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 I can't prove this, but I would say that practically every camera maker of that era dabbled in it it's just 35 millimeter caught on so quickly during the war that after the war it was sort of like why do we need this this roll film anymore yeah theo's got well, a what, what right about there. all the what about all the u.s cameras though the meteors and beacons right i mean it 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 sort of turned into like a discount film format you know i mean if for the cameras that did exist after the war they were almost always like single speed you mentioned the beacon Kodak had a whole crap load of brownies that shot 127. Ironically, Kodak never tried to make 627, although I'm sure they thought of it. Um, but you know, the spool was already pretty thin. I don't know how they could have shrunk it down to more, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it remained popular in ter- on the discount market until like maybe the sixties there, there were a few noteworthy models that came out after the war, the Revere, that big white camera, the EE Matic, I think it was. Paul, you just showed one in the chat the other day. It was the camera that looks like it's made out of denim, the Bell and Howell. Yeah, yeah the Ansco. Or was it a Bell and Howell? It's a Bell, Bell and Howell. Howell. Or, uh, electro, electric 127 or something. Right. Yeah, that was one of the first auto exposure yeah. cameras. The Revere iMatic is it's really goofy looking, but it's a good camera. We had the Baby Rolly and the Yashica 4x4. Mm-hmm. The Baby Rolly, the Yashica. Yeah. There was a resurgence of 127 around the same time uh, half frame was getting popular for probably the same reason. You know, film was still very expensive after the war. So if you wanted to shoot roll film, you would probably go down to 127, you know, because it was dimensionally smaller than 120 was. The Coma Flex. The Coma Flex SLR. Yeah. So there were a few good ones, but there wasn't anything quite like the Exact does. It kind of had like two peaks before the war and then like, 1960. As soon as it reappeared by the mid 60s, I think even the baby rolly was discontinued. Kodak continued to manufacture 127 film until the mid 90s. So, you know, as far as recently discontinued roll film formats, 127 lasted longer than a lot of the other ones did. You can get VPN in 127, and, and which is Kodak Veracrome. And that's one of those film emotions that has an incredibly long shelf life. So, 
do not buy any Kodak VPAN you find on eBay. It's terrible. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I just know people are going to go nuts if I say this, but um, it, you can usually shoot that box speed. So that's pretty good to have. But um, yeah, it was a pretty yeah, cool format. I'm working through a ton of that I, I got from um, Cheyenne Morrison and it, it is fantastic film. Yeah. Um, it it just shoots so well. It just holds up. And yeah. I haven't even had to do the the um, the tape thing, the trick on it. it seemed, even that seems to have held up quite well. So we've talked a lot about 127, but there's one company that did not make any 127 cameras. Um, and that camera or that company would be Pentax. <laughs> <laughs> Pentax didn't make anything. But, uh... No, Mike, did Pentax ever make a rangefinder camera? I don't think so. I, they were SLR or bust. The history of Pentax, uh, they're almost as, well, they're originally Azahi Kogaku. Um, Azahi is a, a term that, like, I believe translates to sunrise. So uh, many, many, many Japanese companies use the word Azahi and a lot of brands and symbolization and stuff like that. So, you know, the Japanese flag is the red sun. So they really, really liked Azahi. They started out as just a, a lens maker. A lot of Azahi lenses were just made for a variety of other early Japanese companies. You can find Azahi lenses on fo early folding cameras. You can find them on early TLRs. So they were, um, I don't want to say like Nippon Kugaku because Nippon Kugaku did mostly wartime stuff. Um, I believe Azahi just did everything. Like if you needed lenses, they made it. Like, so they were an optical company in, in the strictest sense. They definitely made it for the Mind 6 Model yeah. 2. And the theory is that they made it for the Minolta semi uh, camera that was labeled as a Promonar but that it was actually made by Asahi, though not, it wasn't badged Asahi. No, I mean, it's, it's very possible. You know, a lot of those companies cooperated with each other in terms of releasing stuff under their own name, you know, rebadge names. It was just whatever agreement they could make, you know, those things exist on, there you go. What do you have there, Theo? Mine or Mine 6. Uh, I know the Japanese pronouns of Mine, so Mine 6. And uh, it's got the Asahi lens. It's got the Asahi Kogaku Takuma uh, 75, 7.5-centimeter, uh, 3.5 lens on it. That's the only one that I think was definitely made by Asahi because, uh, because they labeled it Takamar for one thing. But I, I, I researched it for about an hour earlier today. And that's the only one I could find that was definitely made by, by Asahi. I'm just annoyed because you asked the question and I didn't know it. And I actually had the camera yeah, right here. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I've never seen one of those. That's cool. Oh, they're, they're great. They're made by Takane. Um, and um, they're, they're both 6x6 six six and 6x4.5 yeah. um, format. This one this one needs a uh, CLA to to get it up in speed. But otherwise, it's it's fine. I was determined to get one for quite a while because I've had I've got a few Japanese friends and one of them is called Mine and the other one's called Takane. <laughs> oh wow. Getting a camera called Takane it was a, a bit of a thrill. One of those, I don't know if it's one you have, Theo, is the exact same body as the Iris Viceroy. They made a folding camera and they had some partnership between the two where it was the exact same body just rebadged. But yeah, those were neat. I had one I got on a lot that Anthony and I both went in on. Sadly, mine didn't work. And it was like, I can't, I can't remember the exact model because I sold it. But uh, it was like whatever the top of the line model was. And I wanted to mess with it. But then when I saw what I could flip it for, I just ended up selling it. But um, they're real pretty, really neat cameras. Does, does yours have an automatic exposure counter? I know some of them do. No, it doesn't. No. You, have, you have to rely on the windows. Well, the good news about that is it makes them easier to fix if something's wrong with that. You said you yeah. were going to get uh, it this one. This one's fine. It's just the focus is um, gummed up. Uh, otherwise, gotcha. uh, otherwise, it's fine. So yeah, they they you'll find a lot of Azahi lenses, Takamars, which were the later brands. I I don't remember off the top of my head what the brand names were that they used in the early 20th century. But when they finally did start the, the desire to want to make an SLR. Saburo Matsumoto was the name of the guy at Azahi that wanted to make SLRs. Like, I think he kind of was a little forward thinking and seeing that th this might be the next biggest thing. And he wanted to get ahead of it. The rumor goes that the only SLR he had 
was a pre-war Corel reflex, which is weird because it looks absolutely nothing like what they ended up coming up with. But uh, he used the design of that camera to create a 35 millimeter SLR, which proved to be incredibly difficult to make. He ended up having to go back to from scratch to come up with a whole new design and eventually I'll just jump to the head where he releases the Azahi Flex. So the Azahi Flex when it first came out was considerably more compact than any other SLR being made, you know, in Germany there, there really was no Japanese SLRs prior to that, but it had an M37 screw mount so it was still a screw mount, but you know, 37 is a lot smaller than what the later Pentaxes would end up having. Uh, it had a, a fixed waist level finder, so you couldn't even attach a pentaprism to it if you wanted to. But um, I think most of us have seen it. I used one as the promo picture for this episode. But you know, they kind of look like a, a Pentax just with a waist level finder and a smaller lens mount. Um, focal plane shutter. They were really, really well designed. I mean, I think people kind of realize, like, holy crap, you know, this is a pretty nice little camera so much so that azahi scored a distribution deal we talked in some of the previous episodes about how many japanese camera companies failed due to distribution but um uh azahi teamed up with sears here's roebuck and a lot of the early pretty much i want to say all maybe all of the 1950s azahi cameras were rebadged as tower um, you can get Tower, I don't remember all the numbers, but the Tower 23 was one. The later Pentaxes were, I think, in the 40s. The numbers are completely illogical. My Tower 22, I believe, 22. Here you go. is an Asahi Flex 2A. Yeah. Uh, do you know what the difference is between the 2 and the 2A or the 1 and the 2A? I have it on my site. Apparently, my site is down right now. <laughs> so I, I, <laughs> if you hear me stumbling, I can't quote myself. Um, so I am going into off memory here but um i know that some of it had to do with a redesigned shutter some of them have the slow speed dial in the front like a like a three has yeah mine does the earlier versions that did not have that plate it was just body covering over that spot but once they redesigned it to have that slow speed shutter or a slow speed shutter speed dial there would be you would either have the dial or if you didn't have the dial there'd be a circular blank there similar to what leica did with the like the leica 2f i think there's a leica screw mount range finder that does not have slow speeds but where the sp slow speed should be there's a, like a blank circle miles is shaking his head i can't remember what that one is either yeah 2f and uh 2c i was okay so it was 2f then yeah i couldn't remember but um yeah there's a difference anthony in, in terms of which speeds they had it, it was pretty successful and then by like 55 maybe they started working on the first pentaprism oh I, I should point out that i think it was the azahi flex 2 was one of the first cameras to have um a quick return mirror which is not the same thing as an instant return mirror so the quick return mirror, the difference between a quick return mirror and an instant return mirror is that on an instant return mirror, you press the shutter release, the mirror flips up, the shutter opens. As soon as the shutter sequence is completed, the shutter closes and the mirror pops back down. On a quick return mirror, you press the shutter release, the mirror flips up, the shutter opens, and then whatever time it is, it's done. The shutter closes, but the mirror stays up until you let your pressure off the button so like your thing the pressure of your finger is actually what holds the mirror up so like if you press the shutter release down and just hold it the mirror will stay up the entire time it won't drop down until you let go of it this is an asahi flex but i'm not sure which model but it, that's the way it works so when you press and hold it the mirror stays up mirror stays up the right. then push it forward to the mirror shutter so when the film is not advanced shutter isn't cocked you can still push the button and the mirror will go up up, up and down yep Yep. Yeah. So they call that a quick return mirror, not instant. So it's still better than nothing. Like, so for anybody who doesn't know, if you don't have either of those features on older SLRs, like the original Exacta, when you're done firing the shutter, the, the mirror just stays up and the mirror will not come down until you advance the camera again for the next frame. So the original design of SLRs is as soon as you fire the shutter, the mirror flipped up, it darkens your viewfinder so you cannot see. And then even after the exposure is made, the viewfinder is still dark until you advance the film again to the next frame. And then that will lower the mirror. So that's how SLRs originally were. 
the quick return where like how Paul and I was trying to describe where the mirror is directly coupled to the shutter release button. And as long as you maintain pressure on it, the mirror stays up. And then eventually everybody went to an instant return mirror where the closing of the second curtain would cause the mirror to drop back down. So I have a question about the uh, the quick return, the, the middle, I guess, iteration of that. Would there be any situation where because it was because the mirror was um, connected with the shutter release button that if you ha say happen to have a, a one second exposure and then you let go of the the button before that happened, that it would close before the exposure was done? Yes, you, you described that situation perfectly, Mario. There could be instances where if you use the long shutter speed, where you'd have to hold your button, your finger down on the button for as long as the exposure was made. Because if you lift your finger off the button before this, the second curtain had closed, the mirror would effectively block the light from hitting, hitting the film plane. I don't think I'd like that. Well, I guess... If you got used to it, you'd be used to it, but I don't think I yeah. like it, given given what we have now, you know? <laughs> it was just a lack of the, of understanding of what people wanted, you know, the technology needed to make it work. So right. um, one thing that I was told by a couple different people who fix cameras is that most 35 millimeter SLR designs, and perhaps even the medium formats, I'm not sure, but when you press the shutter release, you are not actually firing the shutter. Pressing the shutter release on an SLR starts the mirror cycle process. And it's the actual mirror that causes the shutter to fire. So that's why on a lot of SLRs, if the mirror is stuck, the shutter is almost always stuck too. Because you need the mirror to completely finish its cycle before you could even be get the shutter to fire. So you have to have the mirror up, then the shutter fires, then the finishing of the shutter firing sequence allows the mirror to drop back down again. And that's how instant return SLRs work. But what we're describing with the early Azahi flexes is that all they did was they coupled the action of the shutter release to the mirror. So, you know, those of you listening can't see me flipping my hand up and down, but pressing the shutter release causes the mirror to go up and down, regardless of what the shutter is doing. So uh, on anything faster than probably one fifteenth of a second, the mirror moves slower than the shutter does. So you're probably going to be fine. But um, right. yeah, if you tried to do a one second shutter on an early Azahi flight, I, honestly, I don't even know if they go down to that. Yep. My, mine has a one second exposure. It does go down to one. Okay. So it yeah, you just, you either. And again, I, again, I'm real rusty here. We did not find an actual Pentax expert, but I, I can't remember if they changed the design and improved it on the ones with the slow speed to, to fix that. Or if you just had to be careful not to allow that to happen, but they're def Mara, you were definitely thinking correctly. There is a situation where you could, in theory, have the mirror dropping back down before the exposure is finished being made. That's good to know because, so, you know, if in case I would like to get one of those cameras, I do shoot a lot of really, really, really slow film, and on cloudy days or you know when it's getting toward dusk or whatever. Long, long shutter speeds and tripods and cable releases are my friends. So I'd, I'd have to keep that in mind for sure. So Mike, these, these Asahi flexes, they have this non-standard lens mount, but just to, just to come back to the, one of the lenses, my, my tower 22 came with the Takumar 58 millimeter 2.4, which correct me if I'm wrong. There aren't that many Heliar SLR lenses. Yeah. I don't believe there are. It is a five element design. I have the. I recently did a, an article about the five camera books I use the most. And one of them, one I mentioned is the, the Pentax, ultimate Pentax guide. And it has the, uh, the lens element schematics inside there. So it's definitely a five element Heliar, really, really sharp lens, very desirable today. That lens goes for quite a pretty penny, which is funny considering that was considered a discount lens at its time. You know, people wanted an F2 six elements so to have an f 2.4 lowly five elements was considered a bad thing but uh people love it for its character because it doesn't it's not quite as perfect we'll say as like a six element might be you know whereas you start to get in those six and seven element primes and it's like for me personally i can't tell the difference between a lot of them but you get that two four takamar it, it has a distinct look for sure what camera did that come on, Mike? The two point four, the Sideflex two. Okay, so the two point, the fifty millimeter two point two, that came on 
probably an H1 or something like that. If you give me a second, I'll get the book out and I, I'll be able to tell you. Mike, do you have that book by the Dutch author? Do you have that? Okay. Yeah, let me go get it. I will say that this, uh, the Heliar that's on my Tower 22, it's in my pantheon of like my three favorite portrait lenses for 35 millimeter. Uh, it is just one of the most beautifully rendering the way that it, it, it renders the out of focus area. It's just incredibly cinematic. Uh, it looks like a, a 19, you know, thirties black and white film, the way that it shoots uh, portraits. It's beautiful. Um, Miles has just sent a message through here in our, in our um, episode chat. So they continued with the 2.4 through to the M42 range. Did they? Yeah, it's it's optically identical. Um, maybe there's a coding change, but optically identical, and it's pretty expensive lens in both the Asahi Flex mount. I think is that M37. Yep. Yeah, and a little bit more in the M42. I have the later K mount. Uh, I think it's a 100 macro f4. That's also a Heliar. Mm, yep. Yeah. And it's also a really nice lens, and it's it's surprisingly affordable. They also had a, was it a 2.4 on the 6.7, the Pentax 6.7 as well, or was it a 2.5 on that one? 2.4 as well, but I don't think that's a Heliar design. Right, okay, so that's a different design completely, okay. Um, Hong, you've just joined us. Hong Lee's joined us today. How are you, Hong? Doing well, Theo, how are you? Not too bad, mate, not too bad. We're, we're, we're diving into Pentaxes. We've got as far as the Sahi Flex and some of the lenses at the moment, so uh, we're making slow progress here. Okay. Well, there's a lot to go through, but that's fantastic. Also, is Paul there? Is Paul on the on the podcast? Yeah, he sure is. We have the original Paul. We don't have any of those fake Pauls. Oh, okay. Just for Paul, I'm wearing my University of Michigan t-shirt. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much, Hong. Thank you. And I just want to let you know that TCU is one of my favorite teams. I'm sure Georgia is also one of my favorite teams, particularly <laughs> the next game. <laughs> is this World Cup chatter? Hong and I have a friendly uh, a friendly thing going on about Ohio State and that school up north that we we don't we don't say the name here. It's, it's longer. It's more than two. It's more than four letters. So it's a little hard for folks from Ohio to pronounce. <laughs> so is that the American football where they actually carry the ball with their hands rather than kick it? Right. Right. It's even, it's the college. So we're talking about like the lesser, the minor leagues. These are all, these are all the college students who don't get paid to play for hopefuls of making it to the big show. Although certain programs like Michigan have much longer histories than like say the Chicago Bears. That's true. You're right. They've won more game, more championships. <laughs> all right. So back to Takamars. I got the book. This is, um, the Ultimate Azahi Pentax Screw Mount Guide, 1952 to 1977. Uh, it's written by a Dutchman named Gershen van Oosten. Gershen, if you hear this podcast and I've completely butchered your name, I do apologize. But uh, this book is great. This is up there with like Peter Deckert's Canon Rangefinder book. I like it because it covers both the uh, the cameras and the lenses. You know, it's it's kind of like Bob's Rangefinder book, obviously a lot smaller, but it's, it's very well done. You know, he's got a lot of different variants, a lot of pictures. But the, so we were talking about the 2.4 58 millimeter. It is a five element and three group design. It was produced from May, 1957 to March, 1958. So very short production run. So that adds to its collectability because very few were made. So th that came, then the next one was the 55 F2 Auto Takamar. They made an F2 58 millimeter at the exact same time. So that was slightly faster, a six element design. In terms of sub F2, they made a whole bunch of F2. So there was the Takamar 2.2 55 millimeter which is a five element and five group design, which would not make it a Heliar. It's just some other design. And I am not really good at knowing designs. And then they made an auto Takamar F2.2, 55 millimeter, completely different formula. It's six elements and five groups. So say that again, Paul, which one do you have? 55 F2. Okay, 55 F2. Auto Takamar. Okay, the 55 Auto Takamar F2 is also a six element and five groups design made from 59 to 62. Okay, so that would have come on what the H3V or H1, H2? 
It says um, S1, H1, or S2 Super. Okay. So it honestly, they probably mixed and matched a lot of those. So yeah, the H3 yeah. probably had it too. The only difference between the S and H models is the H are the Highland or Honeywell uh, American exporter ones, whereas the Japanese Azahis were just called S's. But if you have an S1 or an H1, Pentax are exactly the same. But that lens, Paul, was only made in the 42 millimeter mount, not the 37. Right. 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 I, I've got, uh, I have an H1, H1A, and an H2. And then they made a Super Takumar uh, version of that lens, which the difference in Takumar speak, if you hear that it is auto Takumar versus super Takumar, the difference is the autos have that lever where you have to manually open it up and then it'll pop back, which I actually really like. I think it's a cool feature. The super Takumars do not have that lever. They have, they, they, work automatically uh and they usually have a little switch for auto or manual so a lot of those early auto takamars had that little lever uh the early auto yashinans were very very similar um i have one of the yashinans also that yeah the rendering on those two lenses are almost identical yeah i've never ever heard any conclusive proof of this it could just be pure speculation but it seems awfully strange that they're so similar those early yashinans and the takumars are I, somebody copied off somebody else uh because they even look almost the same they do they do they look very similar yeah so mike if i can ask you a question if we sure we jump ahead this is where i get very confused and i'm hoping that you can help me here we jump ahead to 1957 and asahi introduces the pentax so the first slr was just called the Pentax and that was like not the brand name but rather the model name. Yeah, so uh when they were working on a Pentaprism model, there are prototypes on my site of Azahi Flexes with prisms and they still called them Azahi Flex at that time. But they had the 37 millimeter mount, they ended up switching to the 42 millimeter mount because by then the Germans had been using it for a while. The M42 was like the Practica from like 48, 49, I think were the first, or Practiflexes were the first ones to have that. So you're talking almost a decade later, 57, and Azahi's like, all right, let's we we need to not have a lens mount unique to us. So they they increased it to 42 millimeter. They ended up calling so the the prototype Pentaprism was still the Azahi Flex, but by the time that they were ready to release it, they gave it the name Pentax, which they actually had to license from pentagon hey everybody this is mike i'm recording this after the show ended i wanted to correct myself here because i'm sure someone will notice but in this next segment i repeatedly refer to the original pentax medium format as being developed by pentagon and i was incorrect it's actually zeiss icon they were working on this camera in the early 50s potentially as a competitor to the Exacta 6x6, but the camera was never completed. Uh, prototypes of it do exist, so I'll include a picture of one in the show notes, but I was incorrect during the live recording where I said it was Pentacon when it actually is Zeiss Icon. Because Pentacon had actually produced a Pentax prototype. I think it was a medium format SLR. I don't remember exactly but um, Zahi actually had to license that name from a German company to be able to use it because Pentax was supposed to be Pentaprism Contacts, Pentax. I don't know why the Japanese said we really need to have that name and they convinced the, the you know, Penta Practica or whatever. I, I guess it would be VEB something at the time. But anyway, Pentax literally means Pentacon Contacts. So that could be like the Zeiss azahi link there uh but you asked me was the original pentaprism pentax called just the pentax and yes it was they did not give it a, a model number um it was it, it was usually sold with azahi pentax so by collectors today a lot of people call it the ap you'll often see it referred even on my site i call it the pentax ap but that's a name just like the original nikon rangefinder wasn't called the nikon one it's just called nikon and we call it the one just to differentiate it from the later ones. So you'll see that a lot with, with any product really where there was a follow-up to it. But they made two versions, well, three total if you count the AP. 
There was the Pentax AP. Then there was the Pentax S, which is incredibly rare. The difference between the Pentax AP and the Pentax S is a switch to the mathematical shutter speeds, a more modern system where you're seeing speeds like 130, 160th, 1, 125th, whereas the AP Pentax was the only one where you'll get shutter speeds like 1 10th, 125th, 150th. Uh, then they released a third model, which I have right here. Uh, this is actually my all-time favorite Pentax. I'm super happy to have one of these, but it was called the Pentax K. Remember when we talked about the Canon EF? We talked about how hard it was to search for them on eBay because when you type in Canon EF, you get EF mount lenses. Well, this is called the Pentax K, and you could probably guess why it's hard to search for because they use the letter the K1000. Like they made a whole series of cameras with a K mount. So this has absolutely nothing to do with that. Uh, this is the final version of the original Pentax. It has the slow speed dial that I was talking about. So it's it's an SLR, but it has this kind of like, almost like a Leica, you know, little characteristic too. I love this camera because um, for two reasons. One, it's very compact. It's very modern feeling. You know, uh, basically apart from this dial here, it could be mistaken for an SLR from the 70s. It's not as big and bulbous as a lot of those early, especially the Japanese SLRs were. The ergonomics on this camera are absolutely amazing. But another difference is... Azahi uh, and, and, and Nippon Kugaku was good at this too. Um, they, the early Japanese camera makers embraced the assembly line. A lot of cameras, that's how je the, the Japanese camera industry was able to be successful is by making things in, 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 in line, you know, assembling them together. The Azahi Pentax AP, the Model S and the Model K are, are mostly hand built. And these cameras are a a bit heavier. So I don't have one here, but if I had one of the later Pentax H or S's and you hold them side by side, these original ones are just a bit heavier. Uh, very, very solid cameras. The build quality on them is excellent. The chrome is immaculate. Even the ones that are dinged and show heavy wear, usually the chrome is in excellent shape. So there was a, a, a very, very high, this, this is about the most German SLR, Japanese SLR that, I, that I've probably ever held, you know, and, and I say that including Nikons. And the only reason why I'm saying this is more German than a Nikon is, is it's smaller. It just, it fits like everything about it. Just the balance is great. The build quality is great. Uh, this one has an auto tech MR18. So it's got the fastest lens at the time that they had where there's a little lever on it. But uh, these are really hard to find. Not only are they rare, uh, they're highly desirable by collectors but they're also just incredibly hard to search for. Cause if you search for Pentax K, you're probably not going to find these. So what was that exactly called again? It's literally called the Pentax K. Okay. If you can see the K there, there's a K. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's how you, that's how you can tell there's a K. There was the model S which also had an S there and then the AP. So if you see a Pentax SLR with a pentaprism with the slow speed dial, but no letter, that's the AP, pentaprism, dial, S, it's the S, pentaprism, dial, uh, K, it's the K. Okay. I'll give you guys a couple tips. Like we talked about on a previous show, you get the best deals on things when products are mislabeled or just not labeled correctly. So if you see a lot of pen taxes and you can't quite make out what it is, the AP has a chrome rewind knob. Everything on the top plate is chrome. The dials are all chrome. You can see mine are black. So that's how you can tell the AP is that they have the chrome dial, whereas the later ones are black. And then let's say you see a pile of pen taxes and you can't even tell what it is because all you see are the cases. If you see a Pentax SLR in a brown case, it's going to be one of these three. They switched to black cases as soon as they went with the uh, S and H series. So... If I were to say, oh, I got this camera. I don't know anything about cameras, but there's a camera. It's a Pentax and it's in its case. And you see a brown leather case by it, each side unseen. No, hopefully it's not an empty case. But if, if they say there's a camera in there and, you, and it says AOCO, so Asahi Optical Company was their logo. This is one of the earlier Pentaxes. And I'm sure someone will comment after this episode's release, but 
huge fan of those early Pentaxes. To me, they're some of the best cameras ever made. That lens is cool too, because it, it's copied like a, a zebra. Exactly. Yeah, very much. That, that's another kind of German characteristic it has is the, when you look at the focus ring, you know, everything's metal. There's no, there's no rubber, but the actual rings have that kind of zebra pattern that a lot of the practicas had, a lot of Zeiss cameras had. Even the uh, aperture ring is chrome, whereas the rest of the barrel is um, black. So it just kind of has a neat two-tone look to it. So, Mike, did a Penta, uh, did a Sci Optical, did they ever make anything other than SLRs in the beginning? Were they like the other Japanese companies that made rangefinders? Or we, it's funny, someone asked that earlier. Yeah, they they never did. They um they went from being a lens maker straight into making SLRs, and they pretty much never looked back. Apart from, as we all know, the um the six sevens, the medium formats, and then they went down to the one tens. Unless there's some bizarro prototype that only Ira knows about, uh, I am 99% sure they never made a scale focus camera. They never made, what is that? What is the, Theo got there? <laughs> the oh, digi- 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 cam. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions or should I just keep rambling? I have a general, uh, it's, a, it's tangential from what we've been talking about. Um, I don't know if we're looking for a, a lane change. But, sure, go ahead. Uh, I've been investing more and more in photo books. And it's like disheartening to see the prices for so many of them. Um, I was just curious, how are other people like learning from other famous photographers when you can't always go see their prints, you know, hung on a wall at a museum and seeing them on the screen is, you know, is not the same as seeing them on paper. It's just, I bought a a copy of uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson's The Decisive Moment and it was like $140 for a reprint. Wow. Um, anyway, just general, um, yeah, it's just insane how expensive they are. Especially since they're reprints, a lot of them are just reprints as well, which which is a little bit of a shame because it, it would benefit for people to have them a lot more available and, and you'd be able to actually access them. Uh, but I, I agree with you, Miles. It's, it's actually quite disheartening. I've looked at a few uh, photo books and I collect a few myself. And the prices are just going insane on some of these. You know, I was looking for Fan Ho's, uh, some books, some uh, photo books uh, for him. And the used market's crazy. But uh, one of the Classic Lenses podcast guys, Perry G, got me in touch with a gallery in Hong Kong. It was still expensive, but it was a lot cheaper um, doing it that way. So there's like, I don't know, sometimes you just have to be resourceful. Well, there are some bookstores that specialize in photo books. Yeah, and I'm embarrassed because I, I know one of the guys, I can't remember his name. He's in in, in Freeport, Maine. Uh, in fact, he's sharing a space with the old Zone 6 people up there. And he's, and there's another uh, great photo book store in Santa Fe. But, uh, you know, the, th- the thing is, you the, with the cost of printing today, you can't you can't print them. Bob knows this because he, I'm sure you went through it with your your. Oh, God, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so un, it's so unbelievably expensive to do. The the vast majority of the best printed books today are done in China because they do the best work at the lowest price. But when you get into the photo reproduction books, they're like we're, we're talking about, it really has to be sheet fed gravure or some other very high end method of reproduction in order to get all the tones and the resolution. But it's just not a cheap process. And uh, because of that, it, it is expensive. I, I collect actual photographs as well as books. And uh, the prices on photographs have actually stayed pretty stable over the last 10 years or so. But the prices on books have gone up pretty much, as you say, you know, astronomically. But if you search for them, you'll, you'll find them. I mean, it depends on what you're looking for. I, I just recently picked up uh, Clarence John Laughlin's uh, Haunter of Ruins book um, at, uh, at a very reasonable price. I mean, they're they're out there. My kids just got their school pictures back from the school. And, and it's not exactly what you're talking about, but even school pictures aren't, they're not photographs. They're just printed on like a dot matrix or inkjet yeah. printer. You know, you look really close, you see all the dots and it's like, God, we've, we've stepped the, the space shuttle program. We've lost all that technology to go back to the moon. We've had to start over completely. And I kind of feel the same way with, uh, with photography, it's the the technology we've lost what we used to be able to do, and the quality of most color prints. And I'm I'm doing rabbit ears in the air. It's just so much lower than they used to be. 
Well, Mike, were those were they the proofs or were they finished prints? <laughs> finished prints. Were they real? Well, wow. you look really close. It's all dots. That's terrible. They're not for not. I mean, granted, they're digital photos, but yeah, but they're not going to last. I mean, I know. I mean, even someone as young as you are, you probably have some of your school pictures from yeah, when you were a kid. They got a and, nice orange hue to it, most of them, but you know, they still exist. <laughs> well, I'm so old. Mine were mine were hand tinted. Yeah, but, you know, it's they're, they're going to last because they were pretty much archivally processed. They're not daguerreotypes. <laughs> <laughs> We said he's original, Paul, not ancient, Paul. <laughs> In regards, well, real quick, Hong, you mentioned you talked to Perry G. Is he like, can you get a hold of him? No, this was a long time ago. This okay. was like on, the, in the, on the Facebook group, but I was like, really, I really wanted that photo yeah. book. Of photo. Okay. Cause he appeared on the very first cocaine and waffles uh, episode of this show. And I I've actually tried to get a hold of him since, but he's completely cut himself off from all social media. I don't know if it's the, Chinese occupation in Hong Kong is I'm sure that has something to do with it, but I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I, I, I understand that he still lives in Hong Kong. So okay. That's probably All right. Smart. Back up, back on the p- pin text. Yeah. Grip. Uh, once we get away from the, the first pentaprism models, how long are there models between that and the spotmatic or is the spotmatic just like the, the next iteration? I would consider the Spotmatics to be like the third generation. You know, the first generation would be the A, P, S, and K. And then you have the S and the H models, which, like I said, the only real difference being if it's an S, it's um, a Japanese or non-North American market. And if it's got an H, it's either the Highland or Honeywell versions. But they had the one, two, three. I, I can't pretend to memorize all the features, but these are all still mechanical. The easiest way to identify the S or the H series is although they did lose, where the hell did I put it? I lost my pen tag. Oh, I put it back in the case. That's right. A- another trick, you know, like let's say you're looking at one for sale. They have on the sides of the, the mount, it's like a straight metal piece here. So see how it's got like, like the lens, the here, I'll take off the lens. It'll make more sense. It's got like this square plate, whereas on the S and um, on the Spotmatics, the leather goes all the way to the lens mount. So when you see these at a, there you go. Paul got one right there. Which one is that, Paul? This is an H1A. H1A. So you can see it's it still has this kind of square chrome piece around the lens mount, and Theo's holding up a Spotmatic, which the the body covering goes all the way to the lens mount. So at a glance, that's an easy way to tell. When you have those models, but um, when they were working on the metered pen taxes, it's funny because they call them Spotmatics, but none of them have spot meters. They were originally going to make a spot meter Spotmatic, but determined I, either it would be too expensive or they just couldn't get the technology right. So at the last minute, they switched over to a an averaging meter which is what pretty much everybody else was. So that's a fun trivia that the spot Matic does not do anything with a spot of any kind. However, can you imagine that the conversation with the marketing department at that point? Right. <laughs> <laughs> they must've had a really cool marketing department because Pentax made the coolest prototype camera name model, whatever. And for those of you guys know what kind of music I like. Uh, Metallica. Wow. Yes, the Metallica. Metallica. Yeah. They right. made there is a camera called I only have a picture of it. We'll show this on the show notes. But they had a camera called the Pentex Metallica. Uh there was actually a Metallica 2 prototype also came out a little bit later. But check this out. So you can see the picture. It kind of looks like a regular Pentex, but it has a huge selenium exposure meter in front of the Pentaprism. What you cannot see is this had a proprietary bayonet lens mount. So Imagine if Pentax had been using a bayonet since the 60s. You know, they could have been so much ahead of the game of everybody else. Instead, they stuck with the screw mount, which, to be honest with you, was probably smart. But you never know. You know, maybe this camera would have been a huge seller and they could have had the the Megadeth and the Slayer and the Testament (laughs) and the the Cannibal Corpse. Um, (laughs) But it it had a bayonet mount. It had a selenium meter. It also had Konica F drum roll, <laughs> an early version of the Copal Square vertically traveling shutter. Yeah. So, I mean, just like try to wrap your head around a Pentax with a 
metal blade shutter. So that means super fast flash sync, potentially one two thousandth of a shutter speed. I don't know how high this one went up to, but it had an early meter, probably some form of auto exposure. That that I'm not sure. Um, but clearly the camera was made. Like they did actually show it at Photokina, I think that year. So there are some of them out there in the wild. Uh, probably there were very, pictures very... to some of the magazines, Mike. There were pictures actually in the photographic magazines back in those, you know, from the shows. And I mean, obviously they probably assumed this was going to be made, but may, they, they balked at the last second and kind of, which probably this would have happened at the exact same time they balked at the Spotmatic. So what they were probably going to do is make the Metallica, which I'm sure the metal comes from the metal shutter. So they probably would have um, advertised it as we have a metal shutter. It probably was just too expensive. And honestly, Konica learned that lesson the hard way because the Konica F, which also came out in 1960, which also had a vertically traveling early version of the Copal Square shutter, uh, it had some other weird technology pieces in it too, but it was ungodly expensive, uh, very difficult to produce, and just nobody bought it. So cool. while this would have been a fun camera to try out, I, I don't think it would have been very successful. Do you know how many copies of that were made? I don't know. I'm sorry. Oh. It's, okay. it probably... You know, the thing is, one of the big things about Pentax was, and, and the, I would imagine the reason it was never made, we never called them M42s. We called them Universal. Pentax was the universal mount. It was the, the, the screw mount. Rico had, GAF had, Chenon had, the Europeans had, everybody had Pentax thread mounts or universal mounts. And because of that, um, it, it was their strong suit. I mean, it was their, their, their point was that it was so easy to add to their system. But to go back to what you were talking about with uh, the spot metering, the reason they couldn't do it was because in order to get the spot metering, they had to go to a beam splitter on the mirror and in the prism to get the uh, to get the spot meter to work. And because of that, it would not work with a polarizing filter, uh, which is what Mamiya did when they did the DTL 1000s and that had the averaging. Oh, spot. that's right. You couldn't use a uh, a polarizing filter with those cameras because it it would uh, it would block black, off. It would black out the meter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It would take the meter away. So that's why they, they shelved that idea. And Mamiya didn't do it, which created some problems for them. So instead of the Metallica, we get the Spotmatic, which is like the Herman's Hermits of cameras, or the, <laughs> the new the, the new Christy Minstrels of, of cameras. It, um, it would be Herman's Hermit without Herman, though, because it didn't <laughs> have the spot feature. <laughs> just the Hermits. Right, um, just the Hermits. But I mean, to me, the Spotmatic as a... As, uh, as a, like a person who missed the Spotmatic era, uh, it just sort of strikes me as like the Honda Accord of cameras, you know? Works. I will be honest. I'm not a fan of the Spotmatics. I feel like they're fine cameras, yeah. but they're just so vanilla that in that era, they're, like my attention is drawn to pretty much everybody else other than those. And I think that's part of the reason I like the early Pentaxes so much is because they did have character. They felt more substantial than those later ones were. They finally remedied this on the later Spotmatics, but a lot of them used the, the what is the 389 battery, the really, really tiny button cell. That probably wasn't the original name of or it. Or M400. It was a 400. Yeah, those original Spotmatics today are really hard to adapt. I don't know if that type of battery was more likely to leak or maybe the metal used in the battery compartment of those cameras, but it seems like every Spotmatic I've ever found, the battery compartment is so badly corroded. You usually have to remove the entire plate to get the battery compartment out to clean it. They would stick. I mean, they yeah, would, they would stick. Problem. They were yeah. the uh, they were actually mercury batteries. Well, there were a lot of mercury battery cameras, but it seems like the Spotmatics. I I don't think I've ever seen one that wasn't corroded. It, yeah, for some reason that model. You'll you'll always find the battery the the battery cap is always chewed up from somebody trying to get them off. And, uh, and if you took the base of the camera off, you think you could go in that way, but you couldn't because it was sealed no. onto right. the base of the camera. But if you take the whole base off, the battery is still in there, but you just like submerge it into like lemon juice or, or white vinegar or something and just like leave it overnight, it'll eventually seep through and eat away at the corrosion and you can get it open. You know, Mike, what you're saying about the bodies being vanilla, it's really, that's really right. The cameras were just a box, but what the real, the real joy of the system was actually the lenses. To me, the lenses were just 
but aside from the fact that they were screw mount lens and they were slow to get on and off and you know it was possible to cross thread them though you really had to work to do that i mean it's that was not a big thing but it wasn't as quick to change as it was a nikon or a canon or something else but the quality of the tacomar lenses was so good and there was such a wide range of lenses available you sure. know all the yeah. way from 17 millimeter lenses up to 500 and 600 millimeters in thread mount i mean there's just a lot of good lenses what do you got there mario uh it's a 400 millimeter uh super tacomar super multi-coated tacomar at 5.6 and i bought this specifically for one purpose although i'm going to use it you know more than, than just this one purpose but i'm i want to shoot the eclipse in 2024 and i've heard that 400 millimeter is a good focal length for that so i'm really looking forward to, to doing it <laughs> very cool I, I will say that if you want character though my favorite of that whole run is the ES and the ES2, which oh. are a, a love it or hate it camera. I love it. it I think that the, the industrial design of the ES2 is spectacularly cool. To me, that camera is is like, it just fits me. It's a joy to use. Just sort of like you were talking about the early, uh, the K. For me, that one is a camera that is just pick it up more often than so many other cameras of that era. And it's a, a early aperture priority. And for me, you know, one of the things that uh, you, know, you talk about karma, uh, Penny Smith used that to shoot the uh, the clash cover of uh, London Calling, the picture of Paul Simonon smashing his bass. So to me, that's always going to be the, the the punk rock concert camera of choice. Yeah, it's big. Mike's sitting here holding it up side by side with the K uh, to chide me about how unwieldy and large the, the ES2 is. And honestly, I don't think it's that big. I mean, it's it's appropriately sized for its era, but you don't realize how much bigger the ES is from the earlier cameras until you see them side by side. But I, I agree with you, it's balance. Without a doubt, the thing that's the worst about the ES2 is the battery compartment. It's held on. It requires four button cells, and it's got this really tiny lever that's like you kind of got to jam your fingernail in there and slide it. But other than that, though, it's what auto exposure is aperture priority, right? Right. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and Paul's right, too. The lenses were the strength of this whole system. The biggest problem with the EF and EF2 is find, to find one that works. Yeah, they, they haven't been the most reliable oh. model. I, I've got an unsubstantiated statistic for everybody here, and it's totally unsubstantiated, but I reckon the Spotmatics were the camera that have the most engraved Social security numbers or driver's licenses on the on the planet. No, honest. I honestly think you could be right there. You're you're probably right. It was probably it was in the instruction book. The instruction book on page four said, "Get a first. Go buy a Dremel tool, <laughs> and then yeah. wait, camera." <laughs> but wait, regarding the Spotmatic, weren't the Spotmatics like? One of the biggest sellers in the 60s. Oh, like yeah. It was, the million. Oh, it was yeah. a couple of years. It was number one in the world. Right. And the other thing was when the Spotmatic first came out, wasn't the key selling point having that meter, that through the lens metering? Wasn't that really like the thing that they were hanging their hat on? I mean, how many other cameras were there at the time that had that feature in the early Topcon. 60s? Besides Topcon. Topcon. Right. The TTL. So the SRT came out in 66. When did Canon switch to through the lens? That would have been around that same time, like the Pelix, so 65. What about the Photomics? Um, Nikon Photomic would have been what, Bob, 66, no, 67? The, no, earlier than that. I bought my first Photomic uh, in about 63. Well, with, the, with the through the lens metering, though. Right, right, yeah. Okay, so you had the flag. The flag model would have been early 60s? Yeah. Okay, but there's also, to Hong's point, though, there's a huge price disparity between back then a Nikon and a Pentax, though. So oh, yeah. I, I presume to what he's saying, it appealed to people who wanted that feature, but maybe couldn't afford a Nikon. So it, it honestly, you know, my diss of the Pentax being vanilla allowed it probably to be less expensive, you know, and you could get a really good system that could support German lenses if that was your thing or whatever you wanted to use by any other company, but some of the greatest lenses that existed at the time and a screw mount simple camera that wasn't that expensive. So um, I could totally see why 
they were so expensive, or I'm sorry, so popular. It, and maybe to Theo's social security number point, it was to a market of people who couldn't otherwise afford a nice camera. So maybe that's why they did it, you know? But they were sold in specialty stores more than discount houses or uh, department stores. The department stores sold the Mamiya's and, and then later the Ricos. But the, the specialty stores uh, really got behind the Pentax brand. Especially yeah. because Honeywell marketed them that way. But I also think this comes back to your point earlier about the Pentax really mastered mass production at high quality. Yeah. You know, I think that they were able to crank them out at a level that uh, approached the higher end market, but at a much better price. And again, the Honda Accord of, of ca- yeah. or Honda Civic of cameras, you know, they there's millions of them out there. And they were for the most part because they were well made. But maybe maybe that's 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 the point. You're spot on there, I think, Anthony, because that's the point. Because if they're to Paul's point that they're sold in the specialty stores, they're not as expensive as the Nikons, but it means someone can go in there and say, I bought a camera at a specialty store of high quality, which they could actually afford. Absolutely. I have a question regarding the quality of Spotmatics. I have two of them. And they're among my, well, they are my two favorite cameras, but I remember, um, oh, it was a number of podcasts ago, Jess Ibarra was one of the guests and she was talking about fixing Minolta's versus Nikon's. And she said, when you get inside of a Minolta, there's, you know, plastic gears and such, whereas Nikon's have metal gears. And that made me wonder about the quality of Minolta's over time. When Pentaxes were made, or when Spotmatics were made, were they made to like Nikon like standards or were they, did they cheap out on some of the internals uh, like Minolta did? I'm going to guess somewhere in between. Okay. I don't necessarily think they cheaped out per se. They probably use combinations of metal and maybe lesser metal. Uh, but the reason they don't have the high rate of fail is that they weren't put up with to the abuse of a Nikon either. So if you try, Robert told a story to me in the early seventies, Olympus tried to throw their hat in the ring with the professional SLRs with the OM-1. And we all know the OM-1 is a fantastic camera, very well built, high quality. However, they are not to the level of a Nikon F. They could not hold up. So if you were to try and take a Pentax, Spotmatic, even my K, Mm -hmm. and put it through what the Nikons had to deal with, they would have fallen apart. But I, 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 that's not a diss though. It's, they're not bad. They're not, it's not like there's cheap, you know, 3D printed parts in these things. They just, to me though, in order to, to compete at Nikon's level, you know, it took Canon. To 71, 1971. Okay, so a little more than a decade to even come close. Yeah. You know, and I would argue Canon didn't really equal or surpass Nikon till the EOS. Minolta tried with the XK, X1, whatever it's called. They didn't compete at all. Pentax had the LX. We were talking about that earlier. Um, in 1980, which spec for spec was very similar to the F3, you know, and I, in some ways it probably did compete okay with it, but you could not put any of those cameras through the ringer like what those Vietnam Fs were going through. They would not have survived. Well, uh, you know, as somebody who came up, you know, as a photographer in the 80s, I, I mean, I bought my FM2 when I took my first photography class in 1983, and it was like one of the first. FM2 is sold by B&H. I always saw that Nikon were the cameras of the war correspondents. Canons were the cameras of the sports photographers and Pentax were the cameras of the art students. You know, it's like the people that were you know, roughly speaking throughout the eighties from the people that I was around. If you were a journalism student, you had a Nikon. If you were shooting sports, you had a Canon. And if you were you know, trying to hone your craft because you wanted to be a fine art photographer shooting 35 millimeter, you st- at least started out with a Pentax. Maybe that's why the <laughs> all the Beatles had Pentaxes. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it was part okay. of that culture. They also, yeah. all had, they also all had Nikons. They all had Nikons also. They had both. But they were hanging out with their girlfriends who were all shooting <laughs> and they were all shooting Pentaxes as well. So real quick, to, to come back to what you asked about, I found uh, in Chicago, there was Shuton camera. They were a Shoot popular down, yeah. retailer. I found their 1963 catalog. And in that catalog, they had a Honeywell Pentex H3V. So this is before the Spotmatic. And uh, with an F18 Takamar lens 
and case it was 229.50. A retina reflex with an F19 was 264. So that's more. A Minolta SR7 was 269. So $40 more. A Miranda Automax was 300. So $70 more. And a Nikon F with the 50 millimeter F2 auto Nikkor was 330. So of all those cameras, the Pentax would have been the least expensive. Now they also sold uh, the Ashika J3, which was 160. So that's lower. There was a Practica for 90. So, I mean, like if you just wanted an SLR, you could do cheaper than the Pentax. What year was that uh, catalog? 1963. Okay. So, and I just, I just picked this one because it's, it's the only one I could quickly find that had a Pentax with competing brands and they were definitely a, a, a more affordable option. Now, granted the H3 doesn't have a meter, so maybe that's not a fair comparison, but to get a metered SLR, you had to jump up quite a bit. And I think I could be wrong, but I think in 1963, most people were still okay with using a handheld meter. Yeah. They were sort of a still hand up. The pros didn't trust the built-ins. Yeah. Right. So honestly, f- for somebody considering like the Minolta SR7 or um, the Miranda Automax, they probably would have wanted the pen- the Pentax. Thinking about meters, I have a, a Nikromat FT2 that I, I love that camera. And then I have, of course, the uh, Spotmatic F that has the working meter. And I have SRTs with working meters. And it, to me... Uh, the Nikromat has the worst meter of all of them. Like it jumps up and down and hardly stays in one place. Whereas the, the Pentax and the, the SRTs, they are nice and smooth and they're pretty spot on. That jumpiness that you're getting, Mario, is is dirt on the wiper. Okay. Yeah. That, that needs to be clean. It's it's yeah. uh, it's something that happens. You get to build up on the circuit, on the, the two pieces of metal that rub against each other. Okay. Yeah. It, I it think... That's very common. Very common. Okay. Okay. I just got it like, I don't know, a month ago and I'm really enjoying it. That's I not, it isn't normal. Most necromats are going to be very smooth. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, it's repaired. And uh, when it was new, it would be very smooth. That's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I have some really bad news, you guys. Um, apparently the Pentax well is much deeper than uh, <laughs> I, I gave it credit for. What do you guys think? When should we finish this? How about if we just table this and uh, come back to it shortly after the first of the year? Because, I mean, the, the, the M well is going to be deep enough for all of us to uh, spend, you know, a considerable amount of time. And, and maybe we'll come up with some guests who, who want to join in on that, too. Who would have thought that we'd have more to say about Pentax than Voigtlander? Or Nikon. Or Nikon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great. Let's let's just uh, let's just table it for a couple weeks, a couple episodes, and and uh, so we can spend as much time as we need to on it. The K mount lenses kind of get uh, shorted quite a bit. I know that, like on the old classic lens podcast, Johnny and a few of the others really had nothing else to say beyond the M forty two mount. And I think that it's time to give some due to those lenses and to those cameras. And uh, yeah, we don't want this to be a four-hour show. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we definitely don't want to short that system or those cameras. So you heard it here. We are going to finish this discussion in a future episode. I wanted to have just a real quick time for anybody that maybe has picked up anything cool that we haven't had a chance to talk about. Uh, You know, we spent a lot of time talking about 127 earlier, but does anybody else have anything they want to share that they think is pretty cool? Yeah, well, you guys, you got me in a lot of trouble. (laughs) <laughs> Last night at, uh, what time was it, Mike? 8.25. Mike yeah. sent out a, a a message to the Camerosity crew with a link to a Nikon S2 yeah. silver dial with a 51.4 that was on eBay at $285. And the auction was going to close in six minutes. Six minutes, yeah. Six minutes. I tried to get Anthony to buy it, but he was sleeping. I was so I sleep. bought it. Um, I bid <laughs> $350 and it sold for $340. So I bought it. And then on top of that, I started going through the rest of this guy's stuff and find that he also has a Contax 2A with a 51.5 sonar on it. So I bought that and uh, uh, he says it's firing at all shutter speeds. We'll see. I, I've got uh, Brandon Monroe has four of my contacts right now to CLA him. So he may have the fifth within the next week or so. Paul, are you going to sell the S2? Yeah, I probably will. I have one that's that's meant. 
Anthony let, Scott. Let Anthony, yeah. no, no, no. Dibs. Anthony's got first Anthony dibs. dibs. <laughs> if, if Anthony passes, let me know. I, Wait I a minute. Like, Hold on. The first ever Camerosity auction. Anthony, go. <laughs> <laughs> Kong, go. No, no I kidding. snatched it off. I snatched it away from Anthony because he fell asleep while he was watching TV. Oh, is that right? Okay. I owe, I owe Anthony. He hasn't even gotten it yet, though, so we'll have no. to see. Maybe, maybe it smells like, like cigarettes or something. Okay. If, if Anthony passes, let me know. I'm looking for one. I, I've soured on the contacts to a... But I would like to shoot what? that Biogon. So I, I, would, I would rather shoot like on an S2 than the Contax 2A. Okay, so hey, uh, well, what's, up, what's up with this? What's wrong with the, the 2A? It's just, I, I just don't like it. It's just, it's clunky. It's beautiful, but clunky. So Hong, you have a bi- you have the 35 Biogon? I do have the 35 2A Biogon. Do you have the Finder with it? I, I have like some Soviet Finder. I'm sure it's fine. Okay. The guy that I got the Nikon and the Contax from also has a Biogon. He, he doesn't have the Finder for it. So I've got him looking for the finder, but he has it listed for two ninety five. Ooh, and I don't know. I you know I can't keep track of him whether that's a good price or not. He says the glass is pretty good on it. So is it the Opton or like the uh, the the post war Biogon? Uh, yes. Yeah, I would assume so because the two A he's looking at is a very late two A. It's like a fifty eight or fifty nine. Okay. Yeah, it's it's going to be a. Contemporary with the yeah. If the if the glass is good, that's a good price. Hey Hong, before you get rid of that context, can I give a go at it? Yeah, I just have to get it back from Mark. I, I you know I I care about that thing so little that I've basically forgotten to <laughs> get it back from him. Oh, okay, that's right. So it's out. All right, all right. But no yeah, when, if, when I get back, I'll definitely send it to you. Okay, sweet. Uh, real quick, I just want to uh, name drop uh, Christopher May. He hasn't been on the show, but he's a local Chicago guy. I met him at Vlad's house with Hong. Uh, he gifted me a really neat Canon FTB. Uh, nothing incredibly special about this camera, but it's a black body with beautiful patina, uh, which which to me is much cooler than if it were meant. Uh, works perfectly. And the lesser camera is a Miranda Auto Sensor XEE. So Chris, if you're listening, thank you. But definitely really excited about this, this Canon. Okay. Um, I've got something new. Today here in Australia, because we're I live in the future compared to you guys at the moment, is actually my birthday. You so, guys ready? Uh, yeah, so. <laughs> All right, let's go, guys. Come on, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much, guys. I have to admit that was totally atrocious. But thank you. <laughs> I blame Mike. This is the last episode of the Camerosity podcast because no one will listen to us ever again after that. Paul, where were the but, flying pigeons? But... The flying pigeons, yes. <laughs> so, Theo, but, what did you get for your birthday? What I did get was a hopefully you can see the lens the camera i've had for a while but it's the mamiya 43 millimeter lens with the viewfinder um and one of the rare viewfinders where the actual bubble spirit level has actual bubble oh, and wow. liquid in it yeah um with the with the full you know the the hood and everything um so um, this is something I've been after for quite a while, especially when I put the panoramic kit in this camera. It gives me a 43 millimeter, which equates it to the 45 millimeter on a Hasselblad x So something I've got quite excited about. And with it... Refresh my memory. How wide of a negative does the panoramic make? Is it just 60? It's exactly the same as the x Okay. All right, so, 65 then? Yeah. Yes, 65. Okay. okay. So... It, what I also had come through is a circular polarizer for the Mamiya 7, which, you know, people are saying, well, okay, big deal, circular polarizer. But the beautiful thing about that is when you attach it, it does this. So you can actually set up your circular polarizer. Actually, to explain to people listening, I just realized this is a podcast, is it's got these two hinges where it actually, the front, part of the polarizer actually extends upwards. Um, so while it's still attached to the lens and what you can do is you can actually set your polarizer to the right position because obviously being um, circular while viewing through it. And at, at the same time, it's actually where the meter on the Mamiya 7 is. So that way it's starting to meter through the polarizer as well. These are um, 
They're not super hard to find, but they're not easy to find either. But they tend to be quite expensive as well. So having that as a bonus is uh, great too. And and it and the actual bracket that it sits on with the with the two hinges does have an option for both the 43 millimeter and the normal 80 millimeter and 65 millimeter lenses where where you can actually um, attach and detach those. Very cool. That's a nice kit. You're going to have some fun with that. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I think um, the Pano kit will be going straight in first, actually, to try and um, you know, get the same perspective as the x band. Well, and for everybody else on right here, we're all in the winters, but your summer's starting for you, so you're going to have a lot of use out of that. Yes. yes. I expect to see some really nice pictures soon. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> All right, cool. Anybody else in a camera lot? I just picked up this uh, Stecky. little Stecky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really those are substantial neat. little nice. little thing. It's a I sixteen have... millimeter camera, but it has full manual control. And trying to figure out that the the, uh, the lens says 25, 25 millimeters. So I'm not sure if that's a true twenty five millimeter or a twenty five millimeter equivalent. No, it's a true twenty five. It's okay. true. So it's it's an equivalent to probably like forty five and your 50 millimeter so it's it's so probably it's the, the standard lens. yeah the okay. normal i have a telephoto for that if you need it uh mario is it the one and a half uh inch 75 yeah it's a 50 millimeter okay it's a two it, it came with uh i think it, it, it's a telephoto in fact it does say telephoto but it says one and a half inch and i so i thought well Converting that to millimeters, I'm trying to be 37 millimeter. I, I think mine is a 50. I have to okay. Up. I just got one of those too. And it was it came in a really cool little wooden box. That's cool. <laughs> now it's just trying to find some film for it because I think it'd be. Did you have the cassettes for it? Uh, it yeah, a special it's, cassette. The two cassettes are okay, are still cool. inside. So just yeah. go on eBay and search for 16 millimeter microfilm. Okay, you, you can usually yeah, find it very easily. You'll have to bulk roll it, but yeah. 16 millimeter microfilm is probably the cheapest way to get it. I have some something by like ACS Data Link or something. I, I have I use the the Fuji microfilm in my Kiev 30, yeah. and you know it's just like it's dead simple to to load the cassettes. And the film was like twelve dollars for a yeah. 25 foot roll, but when you're shooting 16, that's like the equivalent of it, like 150 feet. And all those films are going to be high contrast but they're going to have very little grain. So you'll actually get pretty sharp images out of that little thing there. Yeah. If you're used to shooting a slow film, you'll have a blast with it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> well, Robert had a drop off. Ho hopefully Robert, your wife is feeling better. You know, getting COVID is never fun. If I can make a pitch for the Camerosity Instagram group or Camerosity underscore podcast on Instagram. It's a, another growing Camerosity community uh, with around 400, 350 uh, members right now and uh, uh we post images of all of the cameras that we can that we discuss on the episode on the instagram group we'll record episode 39 i can't believe we're coming up on 39 so quickly here two weeks from today and if we keep our current cadence of episodes that'll be our last one of the year um so maybe we'll do something fun uh holiday themed maybe some photography, Christmas trivia, if we can think of anything. But we'll try to have some fun with that episode. Maybe Santa will come and visit and give us all presents. But otherwise, we don't have anything else planned, no special guests. We look forward to any of you that want to join us and steer us in whatever direction you want to go in. Because as always, the topics and discussions on the Camera City podcast are decided entirely by you. Uh, you guys, thank you for joining. It's great to see you guys again. Hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Thank you so, so much. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. See you, everyone. See you, um, bye bye. If I can get Adam Paul, he's actually a huge Pentax fan and he's found a way to swap focusing screens on some of the autofocus Pentaxes so that you can still get a split image on the autofocus cameras, which they, I don't think they actually offered one. So if we ever get to that point, he might have some insight into the autofocus Pentaxes, which I've never used.